Welcome to SCNC 1111 Group Project Tutorials. In this tutorial, we are going to talk about regression. Throughout this tutorial, I am going to tell you how blind guys gauge what an elephant is. Typically, in an experiment, we would fix certain quantities. For example, the concentration of a drug. We call this the independent variable, and graphically put it on the x-axis as our convention. We suspect that some other quantities, for example the number of dead cancer cells, must be dependent on this independent variable. So we call this the dependent variable and put it on the y-axis. In an experiment, we usually decide what values of x we would like to test. And then do an experiment to measure the dependent variable which is also called the response variable. We would fit the data with some kind of model, which basically is a mathematical description of how y depends on x. And this, my friend, is called regression. Regression is in many ways like some blind guys gauging an elephant. Now let us suppose that this mathematical model depicts the entire picture. If we did our experiment at different values of x, we might end up with an entirely different picture. For example, if we just focus on the far left of the curve, we might end up thinking that it's a flat line. If we focus on other values of x, we might end up with a concave up or down curve, or a vertical line. You should always remember that regression is only a two. Garbage in and garbage out. It will never tell you what the truth is, unless your data are representative enough to paint the whole picture. You can understand regression as an application of the scientific method. Now these data points are your observations. You fit these data points with a model, and you suppose that any future observations you make will also follow this particular model. This is the hypothesis. Usually, the purpose of regression is to make predictions. Recall that a prediction is a specific case under the assumption that the hypothesis is true. So in this case, Based on the hypothesis that the model correctly depicts the entire picture, we predict that if we input the drug concentration as x1, we would be able to observe that fx1 cancer cells would die. This is one of the predictions of this model. Obviously, you can pick whatever values on x-axis and test it for its y-value. Of course, the scientific method is not just about making hypotheses and predictions. We have to test whether these predictions are correct in order to demonstrate that the model is true. This is a brief summary of what regression is about. The most popular form of regression is called the least square method, which minimizes the sum squared error. And whenever you talk about minimizing or maximizing a quantity, you always think about our old friend Calculus. If you don't get what I just said, head over to the Calculus e-learning app to learn how to use Calculus to maximize or minimize. The following demo will tell you what least square method is about. The idea of regression is that when you have a series of data points, for example this, perhaps you obtain them from an experiment, how do we fit this data into a mathematical model? The simplest case would be to fit these data points with a linear model y equal a constant term plus the slope times x. Now spoilers alert, this line is known as the best fit line. But what makes this line the best? I mean, if you vary the parameters k0 and k1, it seems that quite a number of lines also very well fit the data. 
So what makes this line the best? What is so special about this line? Now to understand this, you have to know the rules of the game. And the rules of the game are simple. First of all, we find the difference in the y dimension of each data point with the model. This difference is also known as the error or the residuals. Note that we only care about the errors in the y dimension and not the x dimension. If we plot these errors in a separate graph, you will see that some errors are positive while others are negative. This is reasonable because as you can see from here, some data points are above the line, while others are below the line. If you sum these errors up, you can expect that the errors would cancel up each other because some terms are positive while others are negative. We do not want this. Therefore, we square the error terms. This will make all the errors positive. Then, we can add up all these errors. Now this is known as the sum of squared error. Now, what makes this line the best is because there are no better combinations of K0 and K1 that will give a smaller sum squared error. The least square method is not only used in linear regression, it is also used in nonlinear regression. Now you have some brief ideas what regression is. Let us start with the simplest case, linear regression. Linear regression is typically what people start with when they are not very sure about what the relationship between x and y is. But a famous Occam's razor, we scientists often go with the simplest guess, if all things being equal. You will see linear regressions a lot in scientific publications. As a science student, one day you may be reading this article on a beach, and you see the R value here. Without telling you what R value is, I will jump over to R square value. Basically, R square tells you how much variation in Y is explained by the model. To give you an intuition, this is the average Y value. And this is the variation of Y. This much is explained by the model, and this much is not explained, which might be explained by other independent variables, but not the X values shown here. You can see R square as the proportion of variations in y that is explained by the model. And of course this is only an intuition, and a formal definition of r square would take into account the variations of every data point. Basically, when you see r value, you can square it. And when you have r square equals 0 0.9, you can understand it as 90% of the variations in y could be explained by the regression model. The positive or negative sign of R also tells you whether X and Y are positively or negatively correlated. Of course, when you square the R value, this will be gone. Other than R value, people are often interested in the P value. P value tells you how likely you could observe this data if Y does not depend on X. Basically, P value tells you how probable this data could be observed if the real picture is this flat line. If you have a low enough p-value, typically 0 0.05 or smaller, we say that it is highly unlikely that y does not depend on x. This is the caption of this figure in the publication. Notice how they concluded that the x-values are significantly correlated with the y-value. Now this is another figure from the same publication. I will let you make your interpretations of the p-value and the r-value. Students always ask, what is the best model for my data? Short answer is no one knows. And that is why we need scientists to figure out what is the best description of nature. 
Sometimes scientists might have some theories or hypotheses in the back of their minds, which they use to build up their model. And then they do experiments to see if the data fits what they think. Here are some examples of how scientists start thinking about the case theoretically. The other way scientists came up with a model is based upon previous observations. Scientists might have discovered the same pattern over and over again. So they knew what model to use in the back of their minds. But they may not know why this pattern is observed over and over again. Therefore, they would seek to know the theory behind this pattern. Here are some examples of how empirical results lead to developments of theories. When you perform a regression, make sure you do not commit these regretting mistakes. First of all, it's overfitting. I have a point. I have another point. Ah, linear line. I have two points. I have another point. Ah, parabola. N minus one point. One more point. Ah, n minus one degree polynomial. So when you have any two points, you can always join them by line, or a degree one polynomial, with three points, a parabola, or a degree two polynomial, with n points. You can always join them with a degree n minus one polynomial. But any regards, you will see that a higher degree polynomial describes all data points better. The residuals are smaller, and the R square is closer to one. But what's the catch? Remember that the purpose of regression is not to best describe the data we have in hand, but to predict where future observations would be. Essentially, when you use an overly complicated model on limited number of data points, you would overfit the data, meaning that while it best describes your data in hand, it does a poor job predicting what would happen next. The other caution is extrapolation. Let me share something that I do on a weekly basis, which is called electrophoresis. I load some proteins or DNA into a gel, connect it to power, and the differently sized proteins will separate based on their molecular weights. The question is, when I load a sample of unknown size, how do I know its molecular weight? To answer this, we will have a regression model. The mobility of proteins on a gel is linearly related to the log of the molecular weight. Basically, the larger the protein, the slower it will move on a gel. Using a protein standard of known size, we can plot a regression line and figure out what is the molecular weight of the unknown protein. We would be tempted to think that a linear model would hold true for protein of all sizes. But this is not true. A more accurate description of the entire picture would be a sigmoidal model, although a linear model would work for a specific range of x. Does this remind you of some sort of elephant? By the way, the way we come up with this hypothesis is called induction. We start off with an incomplete set of observations, which in this case are these data points you have. Based on these incomplete observations, you hypothesize that the same linear relationship will hold true for all values of x. But any hypothesis could be wrong. On the other hand, these are the predictions from your model. And this process is known as deduction. The predictions could also be false when the hypothesis is not true. Just for those who are interested in electrophoresis, these are some of the data that others have obtained. Indeed, the relationship deviates from linear when the protein is too small or too big. So. Beware of extrapolation as some models might only work for a certain range of x. Finally, pay attention that correlations does not imply causation. For example, some people found that those who drink red wine tend to live longer. Could we say that drinking red wine causes people to live longer? No. This is because there are other variables that could affect both red wine drinking and longevity. By common sense, wealthier people may drink more red wine, and in the same time live longer. This is why we say wealth is a confounder. It makes sense, right? Also, even if we have intelligent ways to remove all confounders by having a better study design, we could not rule out the possibility that the other way round is also true. 
people who live longer might celebrate their longevity by drinking more red wine. Scientists have done years of experiments to prove the causal link between red wine drinking and longevity, and it is not yet certain whether red wine drinking indeed leads to longer lives. Although they did prove that red wine contains a special chemical that would activate some enzymes that would slow down the aging process, however, they are not sure if that could lead to longer lives. To make the story more complicated. There are also other ways that you can obtain the beneficial chemicals and activate the beneficial enzymes, but that's the story for another day. The observation that red wine drinking is correlated to longer lifespan is also known as observational study, whereas this are known as manipulative experiments. Both are counted as experiments, and science needs both to progress. The takeaway from the example is that correlation does not imply causation. You should always be aware that there could be confounding variables, or behind-the-scenes player. Correlations are easy to find, but correlations are difficult to prove. This is why we often see X is correlated with Y, rather than X causes Y. Thank you for watching this tutorial.